Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Dr. Neil C Cummins. Hello, Neil. How are you doing? Hi, Lipton. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm great, and I'm happy to speak to you, Neil. So we're going to discuss your papers. One, lifespans of the European el elite, 1800 to, 800 to 1800. The other paper is the big sort, selective migration and the decline of Northern England, 1800 to 2017. And the latter paper is, is, is the child quality quantity trade-off. England, 1780 to 1879, a fundamental component of the economic theory of growth is missing. So Neil, your first paper on the lifespans of the European elite is quite interesting. Neil, did elites in Northwestern Europe have, have a different diet when compared to working class people? Um, there is work on this. It's actually quite exciting. And it's, um, I've talked to medieval scholars about what was happening in, um, in elite kind of castles and, and, and houses in terms of the diet. So if you go visit... Um, Hampton Court Palace, the, the Palace of Henry VIII, you'll be quite struck by how many kitchens there are. And if they talk about the food that was cooked up, it's this real stodgy pie. So it was this idea that the reason that we don't see the gradients in lifespan that's common in the world today in the past so much is because of the incredibly poor diets <laughs> of the elites. Um, and, and especially the amount of alcohol they were consuming. And if you look at the work, I think uh, Bob Vogel, who's a great e economist, economic historian, who won the Nobel Prize, worked on this and, and proposed this peerage paradox that they were basically just having so much booze <laughs> that relative to, um, to what we would you know, consider an appropriate amount today. That was perhaps explaining why elites didn't live as long in the past, even though they had um, you know, all the shelter, all the food, uh, and so forth. But I mean, I think the paper I wrote actually kind of does show there is, um, you know, if you could just factor out violence um, and child mortality, people lived reasonably long lives, so 55, 60 on average, and then something would, would kill you. But, but Neil, were their health patterns different? Because based on what I've read, there is not a major disparity between the health patterns of the rich and the poor for the medieval ages. Yeah, exactly. That's what's referred to as this peerage paradox. So you don't see the kind of gradient. Like in today's world, if you look at, say, a country like England or the UK, you can find postcodes where um, life expectancy is, is 15, on the region of 15 years gap between, say, the poorest areas of Glasgow and the richest areas of central London, uh, Chelsea, for example. Like you'll see huge gaps in terms of length of life by, by status. Whereas in the past, we don't see that huge gap between the rich and the poor, but, there, but, there, but there, there are differences, of course. And I also discovered another interesting finding in your, in your research. Women were actually quite susceptible to diseases. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the big thing for m m uh, female mortality in the past was the hazard of childbirth. So you're talking about almost like a game of Russian roulette with a revolver. <laughs> um, oh, it was, it, it's pretty extreme. It's like 12, one in eight births or 12%. And there'd be huge variability on that. But lot, lots of women would lose their life in, in childbirth. And you actually see it when you see the distribution, even amongst uh, aristocratic women, you'll, you'll still see that there is this quite elevated mortality during their child rearing ages. Yes, m many of us may not be aware, but the washing machine actually tremendously improved the living conditions of women. Prior to modern technologies, living as a woman was literally hell. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, my study was focused on aristocratic women, so many of them, they, they weren't washing. Oh, oh yeah, they, <laughs> they, 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 they weren't working class women, okay. No, but it was more, it was more childbirth, I would say, uh, for these women. Because, um, you know, but, but many aristocratic women just never got married. Uh, there's this huge kind of rates of, um, I guess, celibacy or, or apparent celibacy. Um, it is quite a striking feature that uh, the kind of marriage patterns of the European elites. Actually, that's why I started that project was to look at their marriage patterns. And you see some fascinating things. And I've got work in progress on that. 
Um, but it kind of makes sense. I mean, if, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting to kind of understand the extent to which people may or may not have been aware, aware of the actual hazards of, 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 of female mortality, but I guess mortality was just so much more widespread in the past than it is today that, um, that, you know, and this maybe explains, you know, the prevalence of religious belief in the past, you know, it's, uh, you know, these things are, are all uh, connected, I would say, culturally. Neil, I must read this quote on page on, on page 432. If plague killed more women than men, a simple supply side effect increasing female agency in the marriage market could explain the origin of the European marriage pattern. Yeah, yeah. So that was a speculation based on analysis of plague mortality by sex that I've also replicated in other places, but I haven't I haven't put out any work on that just yet because I'm, I'm, I'm still working on it. Basically, the idea would be that if there was this differential effect that perhaps like, uh, and, and the suggestion is that plague perhaps might have killed more women than men, that it that will adjust the effective sex ratio in, in, in the marriage market. So if you look at contemporary China, because of the one child policy and the um, and the, the, the prevalence of son preference in China, it means that women today in the marriage market have their pick of the men, you know, so the effect of sex ratio gives you a sense of, of, of who has power in the marriage market, who's who's marrying up, who can be the pickier of, of, the, of the sexes. So I was suggesting in that that perhaps there might have been some effect of bubonic plague by killing more women than men that might have explained this mysterious origin of the European marriage pattern, which is the pattern of marriage where women get married later, um, perhaps because they have more agency and they've, uh, they, they actually, because they get married later, they have, they have less children, they're less likely to die. So to, we think of this as being generally good for women and women are choosing it. And, and in economic history, in contemporary economic history, this European marriage pattern is really central to understanding the uh, the emergence of Northwest Europe um, as you know the you know where where basically modern style economic growth emerges like several centuries later after the emergence of this marriage pattern. So there are lots of attempts to connect this and to understand the origin. I think it's really something that's quite exciting to see. And I mean. Something that connects with this is um, Joseph Heinrich's work yes. on uh, with all co-authors, uh, the weirdest people in the world, and, about, and talking about the medieval church, uh, uh, his role in, in, in establishing prohibitions against things like cousin marriage and so forth. So we, the, the, there's a very active area of research, I feel, that's quite exciting then on that. And it's quite interdisciplinary as well, which is, which is nice. You know? Europe is an interesting case because even prior to the canon policies of the medieval church, the Swedish family was individualistic and nuclear, and Germans were also individualistic. So it's a com so it's, it is a complicated issue, and other scholars have written on socially imposed monogamy in Greece. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know about the Greek studies, but I, I, I do know about the the kind of the ideas that like, is this something, and it's a classic kind of question, like, you know, in economics and economic history, it's all these kind of chicken egg stories and then dodging 80. So was the Catholic church, did the, did the church kind of invent this kind of new marriage system or was it just that these societies and cultures, you know, were uniquely responsive to, to, to these kind of rules because they would have chosen them anyway. There's something deeper about the culture that probably goes back to perhaps even a proto and in, uh, Indo-European past, which is kind of some, some work I've, I've, I've been looking at recently just for, just for, uh, out of curiosity for my own interest. But I mean, I, I, I think like this is, this is kind of um, kind of where we're at. I, I mean, I personally suspect, uh, <laughs> looking at this stuff, that there seems to be these internal dynamics to these societies, um, probably through older kind of mechanisms where we're kind of, you know, I, I'm not really a big believer in top-down institutions changing individual micro behavior. I think there's something about culture which gets transmitted across generations um, that, you know, we learn from our, 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 our cultures and so forth that, that is um, that, that that really is, is setting up things like the marriage market and and uh, and so forth. That probably yeah. more fundamental than these legal changes. Yeah, northwestern culture was responsive to capitalism. So, for example, we we have known that for a long time the, the British were known for social capital and the Germans for punctuality, but we don't know 
how are why these traits emerge in, in Europe? Oh yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I mean, like it's uh, we're, we're, we we uh, we're poking around at this. I mean, I think you're kind of this is kind of getting more towards I think the the psychological kind of features that I think Joseph Heinrich talks about the the, the weird kind of characteristics, um, as they say. And it's also like, and the marriage pattern is very kind of endogenous in this. But if you're marrying your first cousins, you tend to have a culture where you um, prioritize perhaps your genetic relatives um, as opposed to if you live in a country where people marry relative strangers, there's more of a culture towards merit meritocratic, um, you know, uh, allotment of, of, of resources and so forth. So, yeah, yeah no, it's fascinating. Yeah, exogamy is associated with outgroup trust. And if you are in a nuclear family, more than likely the servants will be strangers. Um, yes, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it's it's actually like an open question. Can I just say, Lipton? I'm actually I've got research on this. I'm kind of curious as to um, as to how exog exogamous Western marriage is in a country like, say, England in the past. In a and country like what? Like, like England. Okay. Like I'm, I'm I'm curious because if you look at the uh, the literature on assortative mating, there's some very exciting research showing that. Um, people are very very close in um characteristics at marriage and some of the characteristics that they match on are things like education right and we see that today but if you actually look at say um there's very exciting studies looking at the underlying say genetics of, of, of that process you can see that the the kind of the underlying kind of say um polygenic scores for education the genome-wide association studies you know you can look at this in spouses and those polygenic scores correlate at a higher level than the actual observed educational years. So there's something going on where people are getting together, asking each other questions and marrying someone who's very similar to them. So I've, I've got this project now to look at this in, in, in English past. Uh, some of it's with Greg and, and, and some of it's actually going back further as well. So I, I'm, I, I think we kind of assume that marriage is exogamous um, and it certainly is not necessarily first cousins, but I mean, it, it's, I'd like to know you know, um, how related people are in marriage, like how, how connected they are. Um, it, it's actually surname studies, isonomy studies actually try and get at this um, for Western Europe. And they kind of show some striking kind of patterns. It's kind of, it's kind of higher than you'd imagine, particularly in say like early 20th century Spain and so forth. Pat working studies. So, so Neil, I'm asking some questions and getting answers that are speculative and this is okay because I like research and I like to dig deeper than other people, but in, in the Asante Empire in West Africa, people also engage in authoritative mating. But I've recognized that despite elite practices and policies in other parts of the world, only the West was able to, to sustain the liberal revolution. So in, in, in the Asante Empire, there was a period when bourgeois and business business people were popular but that era did not last and i think it would be good to study why the west was able to, to sustain a liberal revolution oh yeah no absolutely no i i think i think we're kind of we're not too far away i think like what to kind of what we're kind of saying is that i i'm just suspecting that this division between a world in which you know marriage is exogamous and that marriage is kind of more closer you know um you know, is, is, is kind of like, I'm just kind of querying that from for, for Western Europe, because if you actually look at like who's marrying who, I mean, they they're, they mightn't be so so much strangers as you might imagine. Like the empirics of this, I think, are still kind of open. And I think you're right about the Asante Empire. I think people everywhere are, are, are assortively mating. <laughs> they're marrying people who are very like them. So I, I think it's a human universal in many ways. And then another interesting area of research would be to study the relationship between traits that are predominantly Western and success in non-Western countries. So for example, the Igbo people of Nigeria, some of their mentalities are quite close to the West. So for example, they practice exogamy, they're, they are more individualistic, and even during the 19th century, they were egalitarian in a sense. So you should study the Igbo people of N N Nigeria. Oh no, that sounds fantastically interesting. I mean, I think they're, and, and I think like it's, um, yeah, no, that, that 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 that's a nice pointer to, to think about this because I think like a large part of the debate in economic history is where are these kind of um, 
these kind of uh, ideas coming from, you know, this culture of learning and this culture of uh, hard, working hard and so forth. And I think like, you know, um, I, I think just seeing variation and little examples from other places where you have these cultures emerge that perhaps don't dominate, but, but there are examples that are very interesting. Yeah. Yes, so for example, during the, the, the era of British colonialism, when compared to other groups in Nigeria, the Igbos were likely to resist. They were fierce. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, like I like European history, but we know a lot about Europe. And I interviewed Jeffrey Williamson recently, and he said if he could start all over again, he would study Africa. Yeah, that 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 is interesting. And I think there's actually been quite a kind of um uh, an uptick or a concentration of, of African economic history within, within so some of my colleagues and PhD students are starting to look at this very, very closely in terms of looking at, uh, you know, uh, what's, what's, uh, what we can learn, but, but, you know, reconstructing quantitatively, you know, uh, what we can learn about Af African economic history. So it, it's an exciting time to be looking at this. Yeah, really exciting. But let's get back to the, to the lifespan of the European elite. Sure, so, yeah. So, yeah, but Africa is really interesting. And James Fensky, I would love to have him on the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but he said that he doesn't like interviews, but I'm going to try to get him again. <laughs> but, but Neil, in your paper, you didn't mention intelligence, but could intelligence be explaining why elites were less likely to die under harsh circumstances? Um, unlikely. I can tell this. Here's what's happening. Basically, a huge element that's driving elite um, lifespans is the role of violence. So who becomes an elite in the year 800? Who becomes a duke in the year 1200 when they first start to get established in, in, in England? Who, uh, even in 1500, who, who's getting these higher aristocratic titles? Often it's people who can organize um, effectively um, groups of men uh, in, in, in your defense or attack, basically violence. They're specializing in violence. And the inheritors, the European aristocrats are specialists in the organization and execution of violence. And what that means is a huge number of them are dying <laughs> violently over time. And that was one of the big things of the paper, which shows um, that by looking at the clustering of their death dates, you can pick out historical battles, um, many that are lost really to, to history, might have been minor skirmishes. And so the role of intelligence <laughs> is kind of muddled by the fact that these guys are, um, are specializing in violence. But so, you need intelligence to win a war. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so the survivors are going to... Uh, are going to uh, yeah are going to, it's going to be a function of intelligence, but I, the paper doesn't really get into that. I mean, so, so I've done some extra work just looking at. Um, so here here's 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 a connection with some of the other work I've done, particularly with Greg Clark. What you can do with this measure of violence I've constructed, which is basically, you know, a measure that gives you a sense of did you die violently? You can look at the intergenerational correlation of that. And you can ask yourself, are these people who are dumb enough to get killed on, on the battlefield? Um, or is it just a case that the decline in European violence was the fact that those people just, just left the, the population, right? They just left the gene pool, if you see what I mean, through a process of just natural selection and death took care of them. What you can actually do is calculate the intergenerational correlation, the heritability of the probability of dying violently. And what you see is that it goes from being quite heritable to actually not being heritable. So it's not like the case that people are being re replaced, um, you know, uh, through this process of natural selection. It's just that people are changing their behavior. So it's it's the role, the relative role of intelligence. It, I mean, I'm, I'm open to it, but it, it's hard to see from this paper, this data. It just seems like people genuinely um, act violently <laughs> up until around the year 1500, and then they, they become civilized all of a sudden, which is kind of remarkable because if you're interested in these changing behaviors, which you've alluded to on the call, uh, the, the history of the European aristocrats gives you a very compelling case study of a group of humans that have pre-industrial, pre-modern, violent, um, you know, impatient behavior, but it changes um, several centuries before we think that it changes in the rest of the population. So I think that that's why I'm kind of quite excited. I'm hoping to do more work on the European aristocracy because they can be there a little kind of 
test humans as we go over time to see what on earth is causing their behavioral change. Is it is it something to do with intelligence, like you're suggesting? Is something you could explore? Um, no, no, no. Remember, Neil. So I will be asking direct question, then you will respond. But usually in my interviews, we I like to speculate because the research that I want to see in academia is not being done on a large scale. But this is another era of research, Neil. When do we observe the convergence in IQ between the elites and ordinary people? Oh, that's, well, we, that, 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 like, I mean, I think on, on that, I don't think we have good historical data. <laughs> but what I would suggest is that you're kind of suggesting, I, I, I understand what, what you're saying, but it's, it's, it's a very different, and I think this has been kind of alluded to before, and you're asking it in a very direct way. But let me, let me, let me try and kind of give you an answer that kind of gets at some of it. What makes you dominant and um, elite in, say, the year 1000 is not necessarily the same as what makes you dominant and elite in the year 1500, okay? Now, Greg Clark in the book of Farewell to Arms talks about the kind of re replacement of the, of, the, of the poor by the rich through a kind of Darwinian process. And that's happening at a much kind of more broader level of society. But if for the aristocrats, who are these kind of tiny sliver, the top fraction of a percent on top, these people are not necessarily um, like a, an IQ elite. They, 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 but they tend to have other features um, that make them kind of have the ability, socially domineering, physically commanding. The height differential is, is something that was always noted. Um, uh, and so, the, so there's different aspects going on there, but I'm, I'm quite open to the idea that, say, if you're kind of alluding to the Greg Clark's idea, is like that there's something happening in the rest and the, the other 99% of society, which we don't observe with these aristocrats. And, and what I appreciate about the research of you and Greg is that both of, both of you are not afraid to remind us that the elites are crucial to growth. Oh, I, I think that's... Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, agriculture in modern Denmark, for example, was enabled by the elite, and Joel Moker re restates the point all the time that elites are crucial to growth. But we live in an era that's a bit anti-elitist. So, for example, if I were to say the smart fraction is a better predictor of long-term development than ordinary people, it would elicit reproach. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. There is that division between what economic history is kind of pointing to the importance of kind of local knowledge elites um, for growth, which is in many kind of uh, articles right now, which is, you're exactly right, led by Joe Makir. Um, but right now, yeah, I mean, and I think that that's, it actually is to do with the contemporary kind of um, rise of a kind of a new kind of, a kind of a, a motivated kind of rise on the left uh, against, I guess, I guess, inequality per se. So, I mean, there is this idea that there's a reaction against uh, the, you know, if you think about Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, going into space and stuff, there seems to be a very much a kind of contemporary reaction against that, which might be connected to the fact that economic growth has slowed down, we've got a pandemic, we're going through a very tense period where culture, our culture is polarized between, you know, different spectrums of the, of, of the political um, world. So um, you're, you're right. I mean, and, and, and there is division here between, <laughs> between um, this, but, but, but I must kind of point to the idea that like the kind of elites that Joel is talking about, and I think Greg is talking about maybe McCloskey and maybe others, um, they're kind of more, they think about these kind of knowledge elites. Cognitive and they elite. Are, yeah, yeah, cognitive elites, you're exactly right. And I just, I, I, I don't want to be pedantic, but I guess like the guys I was looking at were the kings and queens, dukes, and, and, and barons and so forth, who like, well, some of them are, are, are connected to kind of, cognitive, uh, you know, um, achievement, <laughs> but a lot of them are, um, are kind of part of this old world of, uh, you know, violence and domination, which uh, might have involved some element of intelligence, but, um, you know, it was a very different kind of world that, that, that these families rose to power that, that I talk about in that paper. Yeah. But research shows that in Austria, for example, many nobles are the descendants of aristocrats. So another question to be posed is, 
when was there the distinction between the cognitive elite and the aristocratic elite? Or did the cognitive elite emerge because they had access to resources because they were the children of the aristocratic elite? Um, interesting, interesting. And I think that I, I think I think you, you you're kind of asking a question in which we'd love to know more about that. Like, where did this cognitive elite come from, and did the cognitive elite come from the former aristocrats? And I think we know that some of them certainly did. And what I would point you to is there is some great work by people like Jeremiah Dittmar and, and then also separately, David Delacroix, uh, Mark Goni on your, the history of the European universities and research kind of centers. Now, the, you know, the, his, these universities were often thought of as just being places where people went to debate how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. But I mean, there is this kind of interesting kind of work now, particularly by, by Jeremiah, which argues that there is some sort of, there's something happening in these universities. And I mean, I, I don't think everybody, necessarily, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, agrees with it yet, yeah, but I mean, it, 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 it's kind of very promising work. And I also see, I think um, people like Noam Yuckman, David Cantony have these kind of, have these kind of nice natural experiments in history that they're able to look at, the, at, at, at this. So I think there's a handful of people working on this so slowly. And I think, like, but the question you asked me, it's very hard to kind of answer as of now, but it's a good way to think about the research agenda going forward. Neil, so I'm familiar with those writers and I would love to invite some of them in the near near future, but your arguments just triggered a light bulb. Tom, Thomas Aquinas was a brilliant man, but he was in the church. Actually, many of the philosophers during the medieval ages were unusually smart. So this is another question and we don't know the answer as yet, but what did we lose by the fact that those men were concentrated in the church and not in academia and, and not in the private sector or academia. Well, first of all, um, it's very debatable where, where you know the, the utility of a lot of academic research <laughs> in terms of um, you know what it actually kind of what it gives us. So, like, I mean, um, I, 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 you're, you're kind of hinting at some sort of misallocation here of of of. Um, of, of talent in, in the economy. But I mean, I think that like the, um, you know, I think I think that kind of also gets at a certain hub here. It's not just that you have one genius that emerges in the year 1500 and then the world changes. There needs to be a context and a social world in which these guys can operate. And I think if you look at the early world of the, the British Industrial Revolution, where you have all these royal societies, the lunar societies, like, you know, uh, all these people who are talking to each other in coffee houses and London and the stock exchange, all these things. And I think what I would say to you is that like, it's it's not that it's, it's you kind of almost need like a, a, a kind of a culture of, of this. And I think the McCloskey talks about this as well. And Joel Mulcair. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. There's this kind of world where people can talk to each other. And I think this kind of like, um, yeah, so I mean, uh, and that, 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 that's kind of what we're trying to understand, I think, a lot in economic history. And if I think about like um, conversations with people like Cormac O'Groda and Morgan Kelly, who, who are interested in this along and also writing, which I'm curious, often talk about like, you know, these the, the rise of these class of workers that are very kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, mechanical and, and and artisanal, and they're kind of bridging this gap between a modern knowledge worker and an old school artisanal kind of worker. And I mean, um, it's it's it, you're seeing this happen in, in England, and it's it's really, you know, uh, the the context of that is it's not just one person. It's 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 it, it seems to be a culture of of, of this emerging, uh, which it was kind of fascinating. Yes, th those workers po possessed what some writers refer to as upper tail human capital. But what's interesting, Neil, is that where the Enlightenment in the f then uh, years after the Enlightenment, there was the free market revolution, we had the Murray Rothbard and Rand era. But for a long time, we're yet to witness a new group of academics who are actually e extremely interesting and different. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, for example, despite the fact that we, we have access to better research and people like jo Joseph and Enrich are doing fascinating work, we don't have enough people who are writing like David Landis. 
Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean, there, there is this issue in modern academia, which is more of a broader kind of point, is that we write specialized research articles and they go through this kind of tortured process of peer review. And I agree that it's um, that it's 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 kind of what I find kind of a little bit frustrating is that many of these articles are never subsequently read. <laughs> so we have this whole machinery which is designed to assign prestige to different scholars that allows us to get hired, to be promoted, to get tenure, and so forth. But it doesn't necessarily result in um, bold research if you're kind of mentioning someone like uh, David Landit. So it's and kind of Douglas um, Nort. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you wonder how these older guys would have gotten on in this newer system where it's very much, you know, this kind of, you know, very intense competition to kind of get into these very kind of, uh, you know, uh, low acceptance rate journals and the acceptance rates have like, like really diminished over the past few decades. So it, it is interesting. And I, you do wonder, like, as someone who has uh, been in academia now for over a decade, and you wonder, like, you know, is this is this maximizing our social utility? <laughs> Um, and, and, and so it is something where I do think, you know, um, I think like, like, like you can kind of have a twin track strategy of which, you know, I think I'm kind of thinking personally of, you know, of writing these academic articles, but maybe then writing a book that try to consolidate some of the, these findings together and maybe proposes some bold interpretation, which is kind of, I think, uh, you know, a, a kind of maybe a, a way to work around the, the, the constraints that we have. Yeah, so for example, you are an astute researcher. I do appreciate your research, but let's be honest, Neil. If Carlos Cipolla were alive, he would be doing groundbreaking research and he would not care how people respond. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is, it is, it is interesting, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that, like, uh, I think maybe you're alluding to the current kind of climate that it does seem to yes. me that we're in a very kind of tense period where people are being cancelled and uh, people are looking to demonize uh, others as well. So it does feel like a lot of academics, I think, would rather just be left alone to do their research. <laughs> and um, I think, like, as you were alluding to, it would, it would avoid kind of any sort of limelight uh, as well. So, yeah, I think we're all we're all products of our time, you know. And I think academics have a certain kind of um, you know uh, set of personality traits. So I think this is but, but this, is, this is the world we live in. Yeah. But our time is selecting for mediocrity. Um, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> yes, me, me, mediocrity and and subpar work because I've read your papers and you don't need to tell me. You obviously for you to do really exceptional research you're going to need to be wealthy or have the support of a patron who does not care if you're cancelled. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it is. I mean, uh, uh, there's also just like what I would say also, there's also the climate within these academic fields. I mean, like publishing is in many ways a social game. So you've got to kind of, there's, there's a lot... Yeah, but that that's supposedly how science works. It's the self-checking um, as well. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but back to your paper on the lifespan of the European elite. So violence declined. Why did violence de decline? We still don't really know. No, that's one of the fascinating things about this. And it's like part of that inheritance story I was telling you earlier was like, it could have been the case that all these people, young men were going out and dying on the battlefield and then they just didn't pass on their, 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 their genes. But I mean, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not what's happening. They are passing on their genes. They die at some stage, but then people just, their behavior just seems uh, to change. But you, you, in terms of that cultural story, you see like the elite stop to lead armies into war and they go to much more of these back, uh, back of the line kind of uh roles in warfare so like if you think about you know uh you know uh richard ii leading you know like you know an english army into battle the last english king to die uh uh in in, in warfare you know and then you, th that was like you know 500 years ago or so and it's kind of like it's it's amazing that like that like yeah we th th that role just changes culturally and maybe they they start. They they just do different roles in in society. More kind of politics, more organizational, and so forth. Yeah. So why why it declines is 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 just one of those. That's I mean that that question is up there. Why where did the industrial revolution come from? Where did the modern rise of uh, 
literacy and human capital come from. So I think that these are the kind of ones where we're trying to kind of get at this, because it is this fascinating kind of uh, path that our species has been on, that we were in stasis for so long. And then we have, you know, various revolutions. And I think the industrial revolution, the rise of human capital, and this decline in violence are all this kind of more recent revolution that has occurred over the past, as I said, 500 years. So, um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, 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 it's very intriguing as to why this happened. I don't know. Yeah. According, <laughs> to, yeah. 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 According to Peter Frost, genetic pacific pacification removed unsavory characters from the environment, but these people were usually working class. Did you read Peter Frost's study on genetic pacification in Western society? No, no, I haven't. It sounds interesting. Uh, thanks for mentioning it. I'll, I'll go look at it. Um, I think that's 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 interesting, but I think that um, it's it's yeah no I, I'd have to look at that closer yeah yes uh, yeah I, I just, I'm always skeptical that's why <laughs> yeah you should be skeptical yeah, yeah. yeah. oh yeah always always yeah. you, you you should be skeptical but Peter Frost has some interesting fr fr frontiers in in research. Hmm. But, okay. but but Neil, and another perplexing point is the relationship between literacy and economic growth. Human capital is a predictor of economic growth in modern societies, but in the industrial era, specific cognitive skills were more important. Hmm. Hmm. Oh yeah, no, like literacy um, is always just like a very blunt measure of, of human capital. So, I mean, it's, um, and I think one of the things about that is in, in say a country like England, as I mentioned before, you see that rising, a long secular rise um, long before the industrial revolution. So, I mean, it's like, like I told you, like the decline of violence, I think they're all, it, this is all the one process, something's going on, some ghost in the machine is moving these elements. We don't see it. We can only see it by the shadows it casts. So um, yeah, no, it's, it's I, I think the literacy, numeracy, the behavioral change of the population is, is this fascinating thing to explain. Yeah, yeah but it, it seems that in post-industrial societies, human capital is a better predictor of long-term development, right? In the past, specific capital or what we call upper tail human capital ma ma mattered more. Oh, I see. So you're yeah. talking about like population level, yeah. yeah yes, yeah, yes. That's 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 what I'm referring to. Mm. But 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 Neil, there recently a thought was just triggered in my head. Neologisms. The last the the word bootylicious, I believe, was recently added to the dictionary. But historically, inte intellectual people created words that made sense. So for example, charisma, intellectual, intelligentsia, these are fairly modern words. And I can't re remember the last time an intellectual created a sophisticated word that was able to evolve beyond being a neologism. Yeah, no, the, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think that um, that's an interesting kind of way of measuring it, the production of new elite words um that's it's 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 interesting i mean i think like i haven't, haven't read many so several books on, on language i mean it's a very kind of organic process you know i mean whether something gets in the dictionary or not it's like it, it, it's happening anyway people use the word they don't need the dictionary to tell them to use the word right the dictionary that's the last stage in recognizing these things so um but i mean I, I'm, I'm surprised though would you not think there'd be lots of like new words in in scientific discourse um you know, um, polygenic scores, for example, <laughs> like, you know, these yeah, things but, are... but these, these words are narrow. They only yeah. cater to a select audience. So intelligentsia, this is a broad word. Yeah, that's interesting. But I mean, maybe, um, you know, there's a certain kind of, you know, like there's all these low hanging fruit, you know, when you don't have words for big pro social processes and it inevitably new words will have to be narrow and narrower because there's very, very little very very uh, rarely new big things that that that, that occur um, but i do i do even in economic history i i new words do pop in uh, but you're right that they, they do refer to kind of fairly narrow ideas but um it's an interesting way to kind of um the the, the production of new words 
um, by, by some sort of different types of definition would be an interesting to kind of, I'm sure you could use some nice figures with that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and another parallel is the slowing rate of macro innovations. We're so bright, but yet we're not producing the next big technologies. And yes, social media, in my opinion, is a waste of time. If you're not promoting a business, you don't need social media. Yeah, no, it's, um, it is interesting. I've got some like, like, like thoughts. I don't really do it myself, but it is, it is, it's almost like a kind of, um, like a kind of a, a huge diversion where we kind of, um, it's illusory in many ways. Like you kind of think, well, you know, if you, you, you think you're getting all this kind of feedback from people, but it's, it's, it's kind of almost, um, yeah, it's not, it's not, I think what we're, we're natural necessarily need in our lives. It tends to be very kind of, um, yeah, superficial and so forth, but yeah. Yeah, and, and Neil, you also did a follow paper that's similar to this paper, long, Longevity and the Rise of the West. Tell us a little about it. Oh, that was the original version of the paper. So what, 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 one of the patterns that I, that I observed was that if you look a map of Europe, there's a, uh, a very like, strong gradient in that Northwestern Europe had longer living elites even before the Black Death in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th century than, um, than uh, elites living in the southeast of Europe. And you, you could see when you plotted this in heat maps, a very strong gradient. And this was extremely surprising to me. And it just seemed to me that when we think about elite behavior, the, one of the only things that you can measure in this period is, is through this data, seeing how long they're living. And the extent to which that tells us about um, about their behavioral choices, um, that this might have been something that correlated with what's known as the little divergence within Europe, where Northwest Europe pulled ahead of the Southeast around about 1500. And the idea was that you have this at least kind of mar uh, mortality pattern that was predictive of that. So that's why I was thinking of these elite behavior. And I think like that will be the thesis that I want to explore perhaps in a book project, is that the behavior change of the elites, which you can see like, you know, through their lifespan, even long before the, the Black Death, um, is kind of somewhat predictive of the behavior change of the rest of the population several centuries later. And just in terms of if we're interested in these changing cultures and the changing patterns of behavior, li living longer lives, less violence, being more literate, uh, perhaps having a more rational approach to the problems of life, perhaps having a more kind of capitalist attitude, perhaps having a uh, maybe perhaps even a, a less religious attitude. We're seeing these changes, I suspect, um, and that's what I'm proposing in, in the behavior of the elites uh, in the data that I've collected. And so it's, um, it's not necessarily that it's originating there, but we're seeing it there first. So that, that was kind of the idea, uh, which is kind of, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think it's widely accepted at all, but I mean, that was the proposal that I was making, uh, that, 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 that all these things that we've been talking about on the call, um, the difference, why are some countries rich, some countries poor, the process of, of growth, that we're seeing the European elites exhibit this behavior long before there, anybody else. Interesting. And another positive outcome of lower violence is its impact on numeracy. There was a recent study done by Haywood looking at the link between the decline of violence and the rise of elite numeracy. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm familiar with this. I, I know it works with, the, with York Patton too. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because the truth is that if society is not violent, then elites can channel their talents into more productive sectors. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, if there's some sort of process of um, these people uh, have talent, you know, the ability to organize uh, men into and win battles, that that, uh, that cognitive talent, uh, as you were kind of hinting at earlier, IQ, if you will, can be redirected towards, um, I don't know, uh, international banking, for example, <laughs> you know, uh, or trade. Um, and, and, and it, yeah, no, it's it, it, it's fantastically interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like this is really, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to talk about it because it gives me some, some thoughts on how to kind of uh, resurrect my, my exploration of this topic, you know. And what's also quite compelling is that when you compare the European 
elite to elites in other parts of the world, the European elite also developed a bourgeois sentiment quite early. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a whole world of um, elite studies uh, as well. So it's kind of like, yeah, that, that's kind of part of the kind of hypothesis that I'm proposing. That is that, you know, we often think about the elites as, um, as being kind of this parasitic kind of element on society. Um, but I mean, I think we're kind of alluding to the fact that they might actually at least be um, signifying these kind of broader societal behavioral changes. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think that, that, yeah, looking, I think what, what you could do there, I mean, it is interesting to look at the social origins of, of uh, traders and, you know, people who had big influence on society in the early modern era it would be a, a nice thing to do. And, and also, it, it's striking that when, when I compare our contemporary elite to pre-modern elites and industrial elites, the contemporary elite is not as active in the research business as pre-modern and industrial elites. So for example, billionaires do fund research, but the research is often political. We don't find wealthy people today just giving up $100 million to a foundation to invest in independent research. It must facilitate its own objectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, I understand. There, there's more. Um, there's a lot. There's a huge culture, though, in say the United States of, of giving towards universities. But it's much more about associating your name with your university football team than it is with the kind of production of knowledge. And I think you're right. People who do give money, um, like say Soros on one side, and say the Koch brothers, they're they're very much fishing for research that kind of fulfills a certain political agenda. So, and I mean, um, that's that's the inevitable kind of um, uh, uh, way, way it goes. I mean, in terms of like people funding blue sky research, um, yeah, uh, you don't see much of, much, much of that. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, that's because it's hard to do it these days. You need to pay for a huge lab. Um, you know, it, it's hard to, yeah, it's, it's it, and society kind of funds a lot of that stuff, yeah. Yeah, we have different norms today we're no longer intrinsic. Some of us at least are no longer intrinsically motivated and big idea projects appear to be dead. Um, I don't, except yeah, for I AI, don't, except I, for artificial intelligence. Yeah, there's AI, but do you not, like I, I, I find it hard to, 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 to accept that because if you look at say something like what's happening in the genetic- Yeah, area, I was just going to mention genetics. Yeah. Exactly. But if you look at like so the genome wide association studies, the polygenic scores, um, I've kind of just like the, the, it, it, it's extraordinarily every day. There are new papers that are just pushing that so far. And our understanding of the genetic architecture of all sorts of diseases is, is just it's just is just a, a absolutely spectacular growing spectacularly. And also, I would point to kind of, you know, I mean, um, Fields go go to different like periods, but I mean I think there there is kind of exciting work on uh, say ancient DNA too as well. We're learning a lot about yes. the origins of the like the ancient origins of uh, the various European migrations in the kind of Iron Age era and so forth, and what what, what the composition is, and 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 I think that stuff. For, you know, thinking of David Reich, of course, and there's also. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, lots of other people working on that. So, so I, I, I find that stuff like incredibly inspiring. Um, yeah, but, uh, but, but, and I agree, and I do agree with you because I read studies on genetics every now and then. But are these studies transforming society? Um, That's an issue. Know, so, for example, people may read the studies and instead of appreciating the data, they become hysterical. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that, like, I think. You know, um, yeah, it, it is interesting where, like, the extent to which, what, what, what's our expectation for academic research? Is it supposed to change the daily lives of, of individuals, or is it just what we do as a species? We want to understand more about why, you know, what, what the, the world we live in and, and and where we came from and these great revolutions in in our, in our species history, for example, and understand the cause of things and there are going to be policy implications of this but it's um you know in a field like economic history which was kind of really focused on development i would say um it's it, it's hard to kind of um 
point to kind of life changing, <laughs> uh, individual life changing research. I mean, but one thing that 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 that, that we we do have is, is in some cases it are kind of good causal studies, which can but they don't often give you the kind of the the answer you're looking for. So Greg and I and and, and I personally have a, a separate paper on the effects of education, for example on life outcomes. And so that's something that if you took seriously, um, you would, uh, that, that would actually have a, a big effect on, on you, but it wouldn't be, it's not. <laughs> and so the idea is uh, we use the history of compulsory schooling reforms in England in the 20th century to test the causal effect of education on wages um, and, 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 and labor market outcomes on survival. And then separately, I've got a paper on the causal effect of education on fertility. And in each and every case that we look at, we estimate a precise zero effect. So there, if you're looking for an everyday takeaway from academic research, <laughs> you know, uh, the lesson is that, uh, that, that, that these compulsory education um, things didn't have much effect. But I mean- yeah, I read that paper and that yeah, interview with me. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, but, but Gregory's not the, the only one purporting this claim. It appears that the relationship between educating the working classes and so and positive economic outcomes is small or non-existent yeah no 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 it's and, and and part of the discussion in the paper is that there was this so societal desire um to find uh like and this expected effect which would justify kind of a lot of people's beliefs um but i mean it is interesting from a scientific perspective how we find that, um, that 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 it's not quite that simple, which I think which I think is a valuable lesson because, you know, um, we can then look for other things that matter. Maybe quality of education matters. Maybe there's something else um, that, that that that's that's really operating here, and we're kind of closer to the truth. Um, whereas, he's, my experience though is that there is a huge desire uh, often to get like a kind of a, a nice result that kind of makes sense with, for uh, for our priors, but often. And if you look at the history of science, we often find that like good research is actually surprising and, uh, you know, goes against our priors quite strongly. Often against the green. Reaction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that the, the world does not work the way we think it does. In fact, all our cognitive biases are just designed to simplify a very complex reality and it's undoubtedly wrong. <laughs> and so um, that's why it's nice to have these kind of causal studies that can actually illustrate that very effectively. I think that the most engrossing research in economics today is on genetic distance. Yeah, that 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 that, that stuff's been around for a while. Uh, you mentioned Enrico Splore and there's Romain Vartsiarg uh, as well. Um, I think yeah, no. So that's that, I think Oda Galore has yes. a paper on this that was kind of controversial. But but I I should highlight to you. I find this fa so fascinating too. But I will say that um, Morgan Kelly's recent paper. You should look at that because that does strongly um, uh, uh, undermine the statistical basis of those results um, because of the spatial clustering of, 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 of these things in the world today. There just isn't, it, you know, it, the statistical treatment of this is, is, is not robust. Uh, what's I'm, what's I'm, the name I'm, of Morgan's research? He has a paper called The Standard Errors of Persistence, and it basically takes about nearly 30 papers that are using correlations of uh, features measured in the deep past, and they could be uh, ruggedness, or they could be um, slavery exports, or they could be things like genetic distance, and then correlating with things like GDP per capita today. He shows that there's a very fundamental statistical flaw in doing that because um, they don't properly correct their standard errors for the fact that the data is not spread randomly it's actually clustered in areas. So if you think about a geographic landscape, mountains are beside other mountains. Rivers are beside other rivers. The sea is beside other parts of the sea. And if you just treat it like mountains, rivers, seas, and trees are just randomly scattered, your statistics are going to be horribly wrong. So what you need to do is really correct it. And what he does in the paper is that he simulates the data with a spatial structure and shows how the research design of all of these papers, 30 or more, basically um, spuriously connects, uh, gives you statistically highly statistically significant results. And if you look at, say, the genetic distance, though, 
it does have the feature that these coefficients have t statistics uh, uh, of eight or more that are spectacularly statistically significant. And it's very hard once you look at that and you start to think about measurement error and the structure of the, of the world that you kind of realize that there's something mechanical driving what is potentially a spurious correlation. So, I mean, it's not that genetic distance doesn't matter. It's just that like the studies we have have this significant fatal flaw. So it's, it's something to, to look at. And it's a very exciting kind of, um, kind of paper because it just it torpedoes, you know, about 30 of the, these works. And I think, again, it's getting us closer, I think, to, the, to the, what, what is actually happening. The, the research on genetic distance is still at the experimental stage. Oh, for sure. Yeah, but, but what we do know is that culture is significant. We're more likely to, to appropriate the policies of countries who share our cultural commonalities. Hmm. So cultural distance can create a barrier to free trade. I have a piece oh, on absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I'm certain that's true. Yeah. yeah, so, and then remember that Enrico did say that genetic distance is not necessarily a proxy for a specific gene. Um, no, 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 no. Because I mean, there's you got to you got to realize that everything in human life, like every feature, is is typically unless unless you have a, you know, so some 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 very specific genetic disease. I mean, our height is a combination of hundreds, if not thousands, of different genes, and then they they, they combine with each other, and uh, and then when you think about a society's culture, I mean, that's yeah, and 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 also like these things are going to proxy for for culture too. So we need to be very aware of that. I think there's. Um, there's some nice work now. Uh, there's an article just like looking at how culture and, and genes can kind of co co evolve uh, affect each other. Yeah, and I co co evolve, of course. Yeah, and and I mean, I think it was um, there's a an LC colleague. He's a he's a PhD student of Joseph Heinrich Michael. Um, uh, more more more. I I'll have to look up his name, but I mean, it's a uh, th th there is some nice work out there on, on that. So I think we're I think we're at a very exciting kind of time. I think there is there is interesting work out there. But I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, scratching at it. I mean, and, and I do share your sometimes it's some of the work is 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 um, you you wonder what it's all building towards. But that, I think that's just the nature of, of of the process. You know, there's a distribution of talents. You get these once in a lifetime academics that come along and change everything, and then the rest of us just try and put some pebbles on the, on, the, on the mountaintop, you know? Yes. <laughs> so for example, Neil, if you were an, an academic in the 50s or 60s or even before, you would have been a once in a lifetime academic. Oh, that's, that, that's, that's far too flattering. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but not in our era. There, few people can truly achieve the feats of Douglas North and David Landis in our era because of the present climate. Yeah, there's that. And I think there's also, I think, when you're the first person to really look at something, there's the first mover advantage as yes. well. And you've got the terms of the debate. So I, I, I but but I mean I still kind of um I still kind of think that there there's um and it, it's also academia is 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 a heck of a lot more competitive. So the, so yeah. each kind of space is a lot more contested. And so um I, I, I know I but I think your wider point is that contemporary academia doesn't select for these kind of swashbuckling shoot from the hip big thinkers and exactly we're, we're, my point yeah exactly and i think like we're all kind of condemned to go very small like because that's 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 what pay that's what put dinner that's what puts dinner on the table that's what pays my my, my rent right you know <laughs> uh, pays my health care you know it's like it's yeah, the, the small stuff but i mean like like i was saying I, I i do think that it actually is quite a privileged um if you if you can make it work for you it's quite competitive to make it in academia these days but if you can make it work and you feel like economic history you can kind of concentrate and do journal articles and maybe have a, a twin track strategy of thinking about maybe having you know, like a book project that could that could synthesize your your smaller works together which i think is kind of when i when i look at greg's career I, it, that, it very much looks like that where he's kind of made these like quite seminal articles but they right, kind right. of they wrote, they wrote a very provocative book set of books uh, on these on these papers so that, and he's coming out with a new book that will be even more provocative oh absolutely yeah no I, absolutely I, I'm, yeah. I'm very aware <laughs> i'm very aware gregory, Gre gregory clark got lucky gregory clark launched his career before the onslaught of identity politics and political correctness 
Yeah, I think we're I think we're all products of our, of our, of our time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think like there has been um, there has been controversy online about some of Greg's stuff. So I anticipate there's probably going to be more as well. So but he, he's aware of that and uh, I'm aware of it. And I guess just uh, <laughs> it'll probably get stormy. I'd say particularly the book will be controversial. I, I, I'd expect. Yeah, but but this is why people like me me do form an important role in distributing knowledge to the public. So, for example, Neil, you are a white man. I'm black, and because of the stupidity of the present climate, some would contend that a black person cannot be racist, and a black person is always the victim of racism. Therefore, I can leverage the idiocy of identity politics to interview interesting people. And this is what I've been doing. Sorry, uh, just uh, I, I took a swig of water at the, at the wrong time. And didn't, oh, I okay. Yeah. Oh, so should yeah, I no, repeat no, myself? No, 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 no. I was oh. listening. I just wasn't ready to, to answer. No, let, let, let me. So, no, I, I agree. I agree. And I think we're all better than this. I mean, um, particularly those of us who, um, you know, like, like consider ourselves open minded and so forth. And I think that um, we, we're living in kind of a scary time where, um, you know, things things are all up in the air and you, you, it's kind of very much hard to know where is the room now? You know, they, they have this phrase reading the room and it seems to be society is all in flux. Like what, what's what's our answer here? But what I would suge suggest is that I think like this kind of idea that there's uh, us and them or there's black and white is so, so actually incredibly insulting because for instance, I don't consider myself a white man. I, I'm, 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 I'm Irish, you know, and I'm a, I'm a certain type of Irish person. So, I mean, if, if you look at the, the kind of the economic history of the Irish, for example, in England, it's, we're definitely, um, and I've actually got a paper on this called the Irish in England that I'm, that I'm writing at the moment. You can see that the Irish, um, are significantly poor than the white English. And the infant mortality rates and also the length of life that Irish people live in England is significantly worse than the white British population. And so I kind of feel that this division is just really, um, you know, like that, 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 let's say there's a black white division. I mean, it, it's much more nuanced on that. There's, there's you know, it, we, we all have, we all have our inheritance. You know, I have my Irish inheritance uh, for better or worse, but 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 I I I don't like assuming anything about anyone that I'm talking to, other than that they're an interesting person, and we just go from there. You know, exactly, I don't care about race. Yeah. yeah, oh, of course, I, and it's it's it, it's kind of just very reductive to kind of think about people in terms of just their racial category. So I grew up at a time where the idea was that you just treated people as people, you know, as individuals. And there was, you know, you, you, it didn't matter what they were. And that's what I kind of still believe, but we live in a time when it seems that, um, that that's, that's, that's not where everybody else is. They seem to think something it else. Is, so, it is yeah. the inanity of intellectualism, mm. nothing else. But now we're going to move on and you, you will be speaking briefly because we're wrapping up soon just briefly okay. about your paper, the child quality quantity trade-off, England, 1780 to 1879. You don't need to be in depth, just be brief. Okay, yeah, this is a paper that actually proved extraordinarily controversial with our colleagues. And so we haven't published it uh, yet. <laughs> I might never publish it. The idea is that it's an empirical test of the idea that modern growth is a function of the of uh, instead of people having large families with low investment of human capital per child, they switch to having smaller families uh, with high investment per child. And the idea is that you could see this in the data. And we have some various fertility uh, observations on this. This is the fertility tends to be random in the past. We have several publications in demography on this. But it turns out that when you estimate, is there a kind of market signal that large families do genuinely have um, worse outcomes than say smaller families controlling for everything that we can observe. And we estimate like really there's, there's, no, there's no evidence that the market is revealing observationally to parents during the period of the industrial revolution that there's any kind of child quantity trade-off. Um, so that's why we're skeptical of this. So this turns out to be not controversial for today's world. You think of Josh Angris work using the instruments of twin births in Israeli data, but it tends to be quite controversial uh, for the Industrial Revolution because there are other papers that do find an effect. But if you look at all those papers, their estimates have rather large confidence intervals. So we argue that our data actually identifies 
um, a very kind of you know small, negligible, insignificant effect, quite frankly. So um, so that but but I mean I must say that that paper was not received, I think, by our colleagues. <laughs> uh, and the, the the point of debate is that they don't believe that fertility is random. So our identification strategy is that fertility is uncontrolled. And we've written two papers in the journal Demography demonstrating this emphatically. And so uh, and, and we're, I think we're both quite, quite proud of those papers. But th those two papers were identifying that critical assumption, which uh, our, our economist colleagues reject. Uh, uh, because if you don't believe that, then we don't have an identification strategy. So, so that's where that paper is at the moment. Um, I think we can we might look at it and see how we could repackage it <laughs> to be more palatable. But we, but we believe it's it's making a good contribution. All right. Now comment on the big sort: selective migration and the decline of Northern England, eighteen hundred to twenty seventeen. Thank you. Uh, that's a, another controversial paper. <laughs> and the idea here is that we're looking at selective migration in England. And the idea here is that there's nothing wrong with the North. It's just that in terms of economic opportunities, it's just that the locus of economic activity in England is in the South. So if you're born in the North, you just move South to where the opportunities are. There's no penalty for an individual if they're born in the North. But if you look at like uh, I mentioned life expectancy by the start of the call, wages, house prices, there's huge inequalities between the north of England, Manchester, Liverpool, Yorkshire, and then the south of England, particularly the area around London. But basically, the paper argues through a surname analysis, we can see these migratory flows where the northern elites move to the south, but also, intriguingly, the southern, the poorest part of the southern kind of um, surname distribution move to the north. And this gives the impression that there's some sort of economic failure here. But what you've got is just sorting sorting in the labor market. Um, so there's no real policy failure. So if you're sending billions north to correct some policy failure, it's not that people from the north of England are disadvantaged in any way. Their outcomes are the same as people from the south based on where they're born. It's just that because of sorting, it looks like there's some sort of problem. So that's that's the argument in that paper. Okay, so, and, and you did mention in your paper that more intelligent people, migrated from the north well we didn't say that <laughs> but what we said is richer people and people who have more likely to go to oxford and cambridge so that might be hard yeah, a proxy for intelligence so what, yeah exactly exactly well, they're their proxy they're correlated but but, the, but yeah exactly yeah yeah but Neil, we had an exciting conversation, but unfortunately, I have to go. So, bye, and it was okay. a pleasure speaking to you. All right. Okay, okay thanks. Then, bye. So, 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 yeah. Thanks, bye. Cheers. Right. Bye. Okay, then, all right.